David Seymour, all the way from London. Uh, he actually left, in fact, so when he came here safely, he was playing. Uh, the Black Fire this morning on the way to Boston, so we're all here. Uh, so David Seymour is a uh, lecturer at, uh, in law at City University in London. He received his LLB from the Polytechnic of South London, of South Bank uh, in London, and his LLM from the London School of Economics. In 2000, he was awarded his doctorate degree in, and he wrote on critical theories, representation of the Holocaust, and his PhD is in uh, social and critical theory at Warwick University. I used to go to amazing seminars at work uh, in the center on race and ethnic relations. Robin Cohn and John Rex and those guys back in the day. Um, so David has published extensively on critical theory and on, on continental philosophy and its engagement with anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. And he's re re he recently uh, wrote a monograph called Law, Anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and it came out in 2007 with Rutledge. He researches and published also in the area of law and film, law and music. He's the co-editor with Professor Peter Goodrich of the series of the title Nomika, sorry, uh, Critical Legal Thinkers, and that's also with uh, Rutledge. So it's an honor that you are here. Um, I'd like to thank um, Charles, obviously, for the invite, uh, and his scan and the work that they do. I'd also like to thank uh, Gina Lorenz for getting me here. And it wasn't her fault that after 90 minutes flying, we had to return to Dublin, at which point we were just thankful to get down safe, which meant I uh, lost a day in Boston, unfortunately. Um, let me, I will talk, I timed it carefully in front of my wife and child, and it should take about 40 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. Um, I'd like to start this evening with an incident that you may know about that occurred on Holocaust Memorial Day this year in England. After signing the Book of Remembrance in the Houses of Commons, David Ward, the Member of Parliament for Bradford East and a member of the Liberal Democrats, which is one of the parties in our current coalition government, wrote on his webpage, having visited Auschwitz twice, once with my family and once with local schools, I am saddened that the Jews, who suffered unbelievable levels of persecution during the Holocaust, could within a few years of liberation from the death camps be inflicting atrocities on Palestinians in the new state of Israel and continue to do so on a daily basis in the West Bank and Gaza. In the furore that followed these comments, Ward insisted on the validity of his comparison between Nazi Germans, Germany's treatment of Jews and Israel's treatment of Palestinians. Because, he said, don't forget, long before the death camps were set up, the treatment of the Jews in many of the European countries, and of course following 1933, in particular in Nazi Germany, was racist and directed at the Jewish people. It was very low level, or what was regarded as low level cases of nastiness and harassment to begin with, and then escalated. And when you look at it, wherever it may be, the West Bank and the declared intent of the Israeli Defense Forces to harass, often just annoy Palestinians, in terms of a checkpoint that will be open on certain days, and then it will be open, but at a later time, and the next day it will only open slightly earlier. So you get there and then, it's been shut again. Really, just to harass. In many cases, to move the Palestinians from land to just give up and move on. And in the wake of this continued criticism of the comparison of Nazi Germany and Israel, and of this presentation of the Holocaust as a moral lesson that the Jews had not learned, he declared, there is a huge operation out there, a machine almost, which is designed to protect the state of Israel from criticism. And that comes into play very, very quickly and focuses intensely on anyone who seemed to criticize the state of Israel. And so I end up looking at what happened to me, whether I should use this word, whether I should use that word, and that is winning for them. For present purposes, 
I'd like to draw out a couple of points that are specifically relevant for what I'm going to talk about tonight. There are, of course, many more. First, the use of the Holocaust as a means to criticize Israel. Second, the comparison, or rather the equation, Ward makes between Nazi Germany and Israel. And third, his recourse to the irrationality of anti-Semitic mythology of conspiracy theory in response to the legitimate disquiet caused by his comments and the accusation of bad faith against those who voice those concerns publicly. That's if you like the prologue, the paper. This paper is part of a larger project that looks at the ways in which the Holocaust comes to be subsumed within a discursive framework of contemporary forms of anti-Semitism. Here, I examine this tendency as it plays itself out at the intersection of two interrelated narratives. The construction of the post-Holocaust or post-national Europe or new Europe, and its self-legitimizing through the transmission of Holocaust to Holocaust memory. Underpinning my argument on these points is the identification of a certain paradox. That paradox points to the idea that the explanations offered by certain aspects of continental philosophy, most, no most notably the genocidal anti-Semitism, can be explained by the nation state's obsessive attempt to eradicate Jewish difference or otherness, reappears not only in their diagnosis of the causes of the Holocaust, but also in their treatment of the place of the Holocaust in the contemporary world. Here, however, I want to be very clear about something. I am not for a moment arguing for an equation of Nazism or anti-Semitism with continental philosophy. Rather, I'm simply arguing that continental philosophy's understanding of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust fails to obtain a sufficient critical distance between the phenomena and events it wishes in all good faith to understand and the methods and approaches it uses to meet that goal. Likewise, although in this talk I offer a limited critique of human rights, I'm a strong believer in human rights and believe the world is a better place with them than without them. And finally, I would also like to say that in the present context, my view of the Holocaust can best be expressed by the words of Hannah Arendt, that the Holocaust was a universal crime committed on the body of the Jews. In other words, that for a fuller understanding of the Holocaust and its significance, one must acknowledge both its universal aspects and its particular, in this case, its Jewish dimensions. Drawing on the, drawing on the concept of what I've termed Holocaust dissolution and its connections with the process of commodification, I argue that post-national Europe's Holocaust memory rests ultimately on dissolving the specifically Jewish dimensions of genocide into an overarching concept of modernity, a modernity now transcended, but thought to capture the essence of the old Europe. Two consequences follow from this initial premise. The first is the strict equation made of genocidal anti-Semitism and modernity, and the second intimately related consequence is the theoretical inability to recognize non-genocidal anti-Semitism, not only in the old Europe of nation states, but also in its new incarnation. I argue finally that it is this lack of recognition of even the possibility of anti-Semitism that accounts not only for the denial of claims of contemporary European anti-Semitism, as well as the intensity with which those claims are sometimes met and the accusations of bad faith and Jewish particularism, i.e. Jewish lobby arguments, that accompany them. The term New York is used here to signify the differences between the Europe before the Holocaust and the Europe after the Holocaust, as well as the role and place of the Holocaust within that transition. It is these points that Robert Fine addresses in a succinct account of the phenomenon under review. If you forgive me, and the quote is rather long, but I'll read out the relevant parts of it. 
After 1989, the Europeanization of Eastern Europe drew the former satellite countries of the Soviet bloc into the orbit of Holocaust commemoration. The Holocaust and Auschwitz became the universal references for absolute evil. In this context, one temptation is to give the story of anti-Semitism a happy ending and to pay tribute to the success of the new Europe in transcending its longest hatred. Anti-Semitism is tucked safely away in Europe's past, overcome by the defeat of fascism. <coughs> this reassuring narrative looks back to an era in which anti-Semites saw themselves as guardians of the ethnically pure nation state and forward to a post-national Europe in which anti-Semitism was remembered but only as a residual tra a trauma or a museum piece. Thus, the idea of Europe as a civilized continent is rescued from the wreckage. In Fine's account of the distinction between the old and new Europe is a series of strictly demarcated binary oppositions. The nation state, Europe, nationalism, cosmopolitanism, fascism, human rights, politics, civil society, genocidal anti-Semitism, pluralism. New Europe, in short, defines itself through its overcoming and neutralizing of the first term of each of these couplets and their safe consignment to the past. It is in this context that I would now like to discuss the connections between the understanding of the Holocaust firmly grounded in the nature of old Europe the place of Holocaust memory in its legitimizing practices of the new Europe, as well as the tensions that exist between the two. More specifically, I want to address, I want to address the idea of these representations of the Holocaust as a bridge or as a hinge connecting to the old and the new. In their recent work on Holocaust memory, and it's placed within the shift from nationalism to cosmopolitanism and national right to human rights, Levy and Schneider argue that the Holocaust constitutes an epochal break. It has therefore the potential of challenging basic national assumptions, like sovereign law in its own territory, and creating a cosmopolitanized public and political space that reinforces moral dependencies. What has pushed the Holocaust to such prominence in public thinking has been the indispensable role it has served in the transition from a world of national sovereignty to a new world of interconnectedness and toward a more cosmopolitanized global society of which the proliferation of human rights regimes is a prominent manif manifestation. We see here again the Holocaust as the epochal break between the old and the new and as containing the potential of bringing into existence the new, whether in Europe or elsewhere. Implicit in this view of the matter is a further oppositional couplet, that between the Holocaust itself and that of its memory. Again, the first term is consigned to the past and the second seemingly rooted in the present. However, in the contents of their representation of the Holocaust, both in and itself, and in the context of New York's memory, Holocaust memory, there is a line of continuity that crosses the assumed and assured demarcation. It is this strand of continuity I refer to as Holocaust dissolution, and along with it, its associated commodification. More specifically, I argue that the presentation of the Holocaust as Holocaust memory dissolves the praxis of genocidal anti-Semitism into a general or universalized account of the old Europe in such a way that any recognition of its particularities <coughs> that may account for the genocide are lost, as is the ability to recognize non-exterminatory forms of anti-Jewish hostility. I argue that it is this idea of New Europe's post-national framework and its representation of the Holocaust <coughs> that forms a connection between what we can loosely term continental philosophy and some justifications for global human rights. As we will see, this connection is evidenced by Levy and Schneider's work on human rights and their reference to national sovereignty and national assumptions 
as the operative causes of the Holocaust, of genocidal anti-Semitism. As such, this aspect of their work chimes with the writings of Sigmund Bauman, Michel Foucault, and Giorgio Agamben. Despite the important distinctions that exist between these writers, and will be discussed presently, a common unifying theme is the connection this school of thought makes between the Holocaust, the nation state, and an overarching concept of modernity. For each of these thinkers, genocidal anti-Semitism is integral to and inherent within the modernist project that becomes the defining characteristic of the old European nation state. The point of departure, however, is to the extent to which its actual occurrence is contingent, or whether the Holocaust is inscribed within the modern nation state from its birth following the French Revolution. As we will see, the trajectory of this way of thinking offers a move from contingency to determinism. However, before looking at these works in slightly more detail, I would like to make some comments about the historical context in which the ways, I'm going, the ways of thinking that I'm going to discuss arose. Both Jeffrey Alexander, in his important essay, The Social Construction of Moral University, of Moral, moral Universities, of Moral <laughs> Universals, that's another paper, <laughs> and Stephen Beller's Introduction to Anti-Semitism, offer a history of the frameworks in which the Nazi mass killings were presented to the publics of North America and Western Europe. Drawing on the tension between universal and particular, they argue that up to about the 1960s or so, the particular or specifically Jewish dimensions of the Holocaust, that is, the special place the Jews occupied in the worldview of the Nazis and in their extermination policies, were subsumed and obscured within a more universalistic framework. This universalism can be encapsulated in the generalist maxim of man's inhumanity to man. It was only in a later period that things were reversed and the specific nature of the crimes against the Jews came to the fore. However, my own experience viewed from the UK was slightly different. Here, or rather there, the Holocaust as a subject of both public and academic interest emerged only in the late 1980s. While the reasons for this surge of interest is beyond the scope of what I'd like to talk about tonight, the evidence of this observation can be gleaned from the increase in personal memoirs of Holocaust survivors, academic reflections on the events in question, and its increased presence in popular media that culminated in 1993 with the release of Steven Spielberg Schindler's List, the opening of the United States Holocaust Memorial in the same year, and the inauguration of Holocaust Memorial Day in 2001. The last two, of course, acknowledging both the tension between the universal and the particular. Yet it's interesting to note that it was just at this moment when the Jewish dimensions of Nazism were coming to be acknowledged that accounts of the nature and causes of the Holocaust, coming from the tradition of continental philosophy, reintroduced the universalist perspective. A common characteristic of their approach was to, to dissolve the particular Jewish aspects into a more universalist framework of modernity and the universal structures of the nation state. Thus, unlike the earlier era in which emphasis was placed upon man's inhumanity to man, in these later accounts, the notion of individual or collective responsibility implied by this maxim that man, or at least some men, are responsible drops entirely from the picture. The idea that the causes of the Holocaust can be isolated within the specifics of the modern nation state emerged first in Sigmund Bauman's germinal study, Modernity in the Holocaust, first published in 1989. One of the concerns Bauman had in writing Modernity in the Holocaust was he found that it, he found that it was odd that if but one of, if not the most terrible events of modern times, stood at best at the margins of mainstream social theory and sociology. In refuting the idea of the Holocaust as the culmination of a natural, eternal anti-Semitism, he sought to examine and understand genocidal anti-Semitism in its thoroughly modern context. 
What, in other words, was it about the modern era, about modernity, that allowed the Holocaust to come about? The irony is that just at, that just at a time that Bauman called for this examination, those that drew on his work or presented similar accounts undermined the careful tension that Bauman presented between the particularities of genocidal anti-Semitism and the universalism of modernity. And at the risk of myself undermining that tension in my presentation of his work, I am focusing more on his general, generalist aspects, since this is a tendency that I argue has been replicated in more recent works. Bauman argues that the impulse to genocide emerged from what he terms maternity's gardening ambition. This ambition was fueled by the enlightenment dream of a perfectly rational and perfectly ordered society in which there was a place for everything and everything in its place. Bauman argues that the attempt to turn this dream into a, re a reality arose from an alliance between the political power of the newly emancipated state and the developing knowledges of the emergent natural sciences. Knowledges that were believed, that were believed to uncover the hidden truth existing behind the realms of appearance. Put into practice through the institution and mores of the modern state bureaucracy, the body politic came to, divide, came to be divided <coughs> between that part of the population that was to be nurtured and that part deemed as weeds that were not. The Jews, or rather the concept of the Jew, came to represent the horror of disorder, a byproduct of the very attempt at such strict boundary demarcation. Although Bauman acknowledges the presence of the pre-modern past in the conceptualizing of the Jews as the other of order, he is nonetheless insistent that the confluence of factors responsible for the Holocaust lacked any pre-modern antecedents. Equally pertinent in the present context is the presentation of the mass murders as the result of the imposition of a state power external to the body politic upon which it is set to operate and which was mediated through the bureaucracy. This last point brings into relief Bauman's belief that the praxis of constructing such faithful distinctions has to be understood in direct connection and opposition to the formal juridical equality brought about by modern political emancipation and embodied in legal rights. An equality that is masked, that masked not only the differences between Jews and non-Jews, but also the dangers that the latter was said to carry within their very blood. A similar approach is exhibited in Michel Foucault's discussion of the Holocaust in his 1975-76 College of France lecture series, published in French in 1997, and in English in 2003, under the title of Society of History of Family. As with Bauman, Foucault's thinking turns, the, turns on the idea of genocidal anti-Semitism as a universal feature contained within all modern nation states in general, and the modern state in particular. This point comes into view in the distinction he makes between what he terms the old nation, uh, pre-modern and the new modern racist anti-Semitism. It's a, a little quote if you're forgiven. The old religious type anti-Semitism was reutilized by state racism only in the 19th century, or at the point when the state had to look like, function and present itself as the guarantor of the, and of the integrity and purity of the race, and had to defend itself against the race or races that were infiltrating it, introducing harmful elements into its body, and which therefore had to be driven out for both political and biological purposes. Foucault's distinction between religious-type anti-Semitism and state racism in turn turns on his conception of what he terms biopower or biopolitics. Biopolitics points to the idea of a new conception of state power and which is characteristic of the modern nation state. Its novel concern is not the life of individuals, be they citizens or subjects, but with the life and safety of a racialized conception of the nation and national population. 
as with Bauman, the, corner of the, the cornerstone of the biopolitical nature of the state is administration. To administer, to identify and ensure against real, potential and imagined disturbances and threats to the national population as a whole, and with securing its protection against hazards. It is within this racialized conception of biopolitics that Foucault identifies the emergence of modern genocidal anti-Semitism. Foucault notes that at first sight, the presence of racism within biopolitics is something of a paradox. How is it, he asks, that a form of power devoted to life should bring with it death on an almost unprecedented magnitude? His response is twofold. First, biopolitical racism operates as a means of dividing the population into racialized categories through which the Jews are constructed as the negative and dangerous race. Second, the conflict that biopolitical racism generates is framed in the language of health and security as the neutralizing of the threat to the well-being, to the life of the now separated but racially preferred segment of the population. population. Racism, now taken to incorporate anti-Semitism, is perceived as a defensive measure. However, despite this pervading presence of biopolitics and of the racism it engenders within all states, an element of contingency as well as the continued presence of older ways of political thinking does remain in Foucault's account of modern anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. He argues that it is only with Nazism that it reaches its most hysterical development. What distinguishes what he calls the Nazi state from other Western states was less, he argues, its biopolitical nature, but the fact that it merged with older forms of political power, that is, with older non-biopolitical institutions and organizations, as well as what he calls the practices of reforming, which infected the biopolitical politics as a whole. However, as Foucault makes clear, while biopolitics of itself was not a sufficient cause for genocidal anti-Semitism, it was most necessary a necessary one. However, it's with the work of the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben that the tendency to dissolve the specific causes of the Holocaust into the universal framework of the nation state appears in its most radical formulation. It is in this account that any reference to contingency is overcome in the name of a strict determinism. Agamben draws upon and develops Foucault's conception of biopolitics. He argues that it is with the nation state that the entirety of life, which means basic biological life, is captured by political or sovereign power. It is this capture of life by sovereign power and its division into life worthy of being lived and life not worthy of being lived, i.e. to be killed, through which the Jews are caught and judged. This is, for a gambler, the decisive event of modernity, quote, the foundational event of modernity. A gambler's radicalization of both Bauman and Foucault's dissolution of genocidal anti-Semitism into a universalized account of the nation state appears in his idea that, race, that the racism he identifies is a, is a present and inherent element in all modern political and legal concepts through which modern political and Jewish emancipation is realized. For both Bauman and Foucault, as we've seen, a tension remains between the formal nature of inclusion within the nation state, civil rights, political rights, legal rights, and which included Jews, and the racialized biopolitics of the administrative state, which marked Jews out for exclusion and annihilation with the latter acting behind the back of the former, so to speak. A gambler, however, dissolves that tension. Rather, he reads the exclusionary nature of racialized biopolitics directly into political and legal rights. Any tension between formal inclusion and substantive exclusion is wiped away. It is a consequence of this way of thinking that no gap or space exists between the nature of the modern nation state itself and the mass extermination of the Jews. 
understood in this context, and despite agreement of the centrality of biopolitics, the tensions that remain in Bauman and Foucault's accounts of the Holocaust are dissolved. In this way, the shift from a concern with the specifics of genocidal anti-Semitism, Bauman, to its inclusion within a more generalized notion of state racism, Foucault, to its dissolution within a universal concept of the innate nature of the modern nation state, the gambling is complete. Now I would like to relate this work to the work on Levi and Schneider's view of human rights. As I said, although they're not, not theorized in this way, Levi and Schneider's account of contemporary human rights and of the place of the Holocaust in their development draws on these accounts. This point is evident in their belief, noted at the beginning of the talk, that the compulsive impulse to modern genocide, genocide is overcome through the overcoming of national sovereignty <coughs> and national law and its replacement by a post-national New York, along with its substitution of cosmopolitan human rights for national legal rights and its network of moral dependencies, sorry, moral interdependencies that constitutes a transnational European civil society. Yet it is precisely in this account that Levi and Schneider's presentation of the Holocaust exhibits the tendency to Holocaust dissolution and modification that is also characteristic of the continental philosophy whose work they echo. By dissolving the Holocaust into the concept of modernity itself, it is not so much anti-Semitism that is overcome, since it's robbed of any autonomous existence, but rather the old Europe itself. This last point merges in the following ways. First and most obviously, in a mirror image of the new Europe, the placement of genocidal anti-Semitism within the overarching concept of modernity served to deteriorize and dehistoricize the historical, geographical, political and social actualities of the, of the anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. It cannot but overlook any consideration of why the Holocaust occurred at a specific time and a specific place, Germany, in the mid 20th century. In so doing, it dissolves the Holocaust specificity into the more abstract and universalist framework. It is in this context, therefore, that the historical actuality of the Holocaust comes to be dissolved within modernity. However, as the above comments indicate, this does not lead to the position, such as that claimed by Levi and Schneider, that New York has transcended anti-Semitism. Their claim, the claim that having transcended the modern Europe, is merely a byproduct to have overcome the seemingly natural, propen natural propensity to genocidal anti-Semitism. Indeed, genocidal anti-Semitism has become the old, U old Europe's alleged defining characteristic. It says little about anti-Semitism that is neither nationalist, neither genocidal, neither political in origin. As my critique indicates, the possibility of the presence of a non-nationalist and non-genocidal anti-Semitism remains simultaneously invisible and untheorized. The danger of an account such as Levi and Schneider's is that since anti-Semitism now defined only in terms of genocide, has not only been relegated to the past, but also has been overcome by the legitimating force of the new Europe, any claim of contemporary anti-Semitism that draws on its memory, even in the most general of terms, is deemed illegitimate from the outset. It calls into question the anti-anti, or rather the non-anti-Semitic image of the new Europe. It is, I believe, the potentially destabling effect of claims to anti-Semitism on New Europe's gilded self-image that partly explains not only the denial of claims of contemporary anti-Semitism, but also the intensity with which that denial is voiced. And so, all that remains in the new post-national Europe is the memory of the Holocaust. But, as I said, it's less a memory of the Holocaust itself, more a memory of modernity, which is now gone, and to, into which the Holocaust has been dissolved. 
Separated from the structural conditions that made it possible, the Holocaust of New Met Europe's memory becomes nothing more than a symbol. It is a, it is a symbol, however, not of anti-Semitism, genocidal or otherwise, but of the old Europe itself. A Europe fragmented into nation states, along with its concomitants of national sovereignty, nationalism, race, and genocidal impel, impulse that is said to be inherent within them. Expressing its distance from the world that made it the Holocaust possible, the new European symbol is recast in the language of morality. The Holocaust as symbol's purpose and function is to serve as a warning to be sounded whenever and wherever any of the tendencies of the old Europe threaten to reappear. The moral imperative contained in the symbolism of the Holocaust is contained in the maxim, never again Auschwitz. It is to this symbolic value that Jubel refers to in his article, the remembrance of the Holocaust as a catalyst for transnational ethics, followed by a question mark, which is important, where he notes that, for the Holocaust now provides the meta-narrative for sufferings inflicted for political reasons. It has turned into the supra-denomination passion story of late modernity. Concepts, symbols, and images are taken out of their immediate context and are employed to code in a single term the collective pain that people inflict on others. The symbolic repertoire has been adopted by political groups all over the world who are subject to extreme pain and distress. It is present in the political defense of human rights, in the remoralizing of dip uh, diplomacy, and in the turning away of the morally neutral real polity. What we see here is not only the Holocaust dissolution and resurfacing of it as a post-national symbol, we also see its resurfacing within the register of morality. <coughs> Symbolic representation within this register forms a context in which the partic particular claims of contemporary anti-Semitism are denied and creates the particular conditions and the intensity of those denials. Depicting its symbolic value in terms of its abstract nature of good and evil, the Holocaust can only serve its role as universal warning and call to action once it has been abstracted from, or rather emptied, of its particularist elements of its historical occurrence, including, of course, its specifically Jewish dimensions, amongst which is the presence of anti-Semitism. It is only in such circumstances that the Holocaust, now presented in abstract, formal, and universal terms, is free to play the symbolic role allocated to it. In such a form, it takes its place as an ethical commodity within the exchange realm of New Europe's moral economy. It is only at this stage, therefore, when the Holocaust becomes freely exchangeable for any other number of situations, is its dissolution, a dissolution inherent in its symbolic value, is complete. Perhaps, and sort of almost by way of conclusion, perhaps the most concise way to explain this aspect of Holocaust dissolution is by analogy with Adorno and Hawkeye in his critique of commodification, hence the notion critical, the type of critical theory. For them, commodification is the process whereby unique and distinct elements of nature are caught up within the near universal realm of exchange. As a condition of entry, each individual element has to become exchangeable for all others. As a consequence of this demand, any specific or particular quality that inheres with it, within it and which obstructs that exchange has to be expunged. It is only when emptied of such content and reformulated in strictly formal and so universal terms that an element of nature becomes a commodity and can take its place within the exchange realm of the economy. It is as a consequence of such commodification and the dissolution of which is it a part of which it is a part. Um, I don't have this on the text on the screen, sorry. But it's a consequence of this commodification that uh, leaving Schneider note, the Holocaust is now a concept 
that has been dislocated from time and space precisely because it can be used to dramatize any injustice, racism, or crime perpetrated anywhere on the planet. However, as Adorno and Horkheimer argue, what cannot be contained within the commodity, that is, the particular aspects, that which makes it unique, and that which resists and obstructs its universalization, reappears in the image of a threatening and unpredictable, untamed nature. While on the one hand, the commodity's formal attribute permits its, its, its inclusion in the realm of exchange, on the other hand, it's now expunged particularities, that which make it unique, are, reca are recast as nothing more than an irrational element of the past, or as no more than a superstitious myth having no, having no place in the increasingly rationalized, i.e. commodified world. The particularities are rejected from that world. They become that which cannot be recognized. They become subject to the status of exclusion and taboo. Let me now make more direct this analogy between Holocaust, Holocaust memory, and the twin aspect of Adorno and Horkheimer's conception of commodification in order to shed light upon the intense denials by so many to claims of contemporary anti-Semitism. <clears throat> Read into the very fiber of modernity of the old Europe and its nation states, genocidal appearance, genocidal takes, and, sorry, genocidal anti-Semitism takes on the appearance of a natural phenomenon and is raised to the status of a kind of a law of nature. From the perspective of the new Europe, whose self-representation turns on the overcoming of such anti-Semitism, any recognitions of, it, of its existence, whether as a continuation of past manifestations or as a new phenomenon, serves to undermine its defining claim. This factor alone goes some way to understanding the intensity and denial of claims of contemporary anti-Semitism. However, to this initial point, a further, a further element can be identified. In an era in which anti-Semitism is deemed a thing of the past, claims of its contemporary present appear to be no more than claims to see an irrational legacy of the past, of less enlightened times. Now that the Holocaust has been commodified, its now expunged content its specific and its particularities, its potential to continue existence as untamed nature, its anti-Semitism takes on the aura of superstition and taboo. And now the conclusion. In this paper, I've sought to understand why claims of contemporary anti-Semitism are met with such intense denial. Looking at the problem within the context of the new Europe, I have argued that the underpinning cause of the intensity of denial is that the account of the Holocaust as an inherent outcome of modernity and its reclaiming as Holocaust memory and universal moral symbol required dissolving its particularities of the Jewish dimensions, including dissolving the phenomenon of anti-Semitism anti itself into more universal and generalized concepts. First, in New York's political reading of the Holocaust, anti-Semitism is recast in its genocidal form. As a consequence, any consideration of modern anti-Semitism does, does not fit into this genocidal content, concept remains both unseen and untheorized. In many ways, if such anti-Semitism does appear in these accounts, it is often presented as no more than a remnant from, mod, from modern or pre-modern times and hardly worthy of reflection. Second, a similar dissolution is present in New York's moralizing of the Holocaust. Certain of its overcoming of genocidal anti-Semitism, New York reduces the Holocaust to the symbolic value of an abstract and formal universal moral imperative. Again, however, this universalizing is dependent on the expulsion of that aspect of the Holocaust specifically Jewish context. In both these instances, claims of anti-Semitism, genocidal or otherwise, are seen as no more than remnants of a previous age, an age now safely overcome and all but impossible to, 
credit with any degree of seriousness. However, and more fundamentally, anti-Semitism as an autonomous phenomenon, one whose meaning, direction, and outcome are not determined by what amounts to an omnipotent will to power, that is, one whose causes and responsibility, and responsibility are not so contained and containable, is written out, not only of the structure of New York itself, but also out of the prehistory of the old Europe that it is said to overcome. In this context, therefore, the abject denial of contemporary anti-Semitism and their claims of bad faith associated with such denial may not be surprising. From the perspective of New Europe, not only does anti-Semitism anti not exist today, it has, as a phenomenon with specifically Jewish dimensions, said never to have really existed in the past either. Thank you.